I think it's really important that we do everything in our power to um, prevent what are, generally speaking, completely avoidable deaths. Talk about this in a way that means that we as parents, as family members, as teachers and nursery workers, health visitors and social workers, and more importantly, just members of the community can make a difference. I think the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child really rings true. And I think we've lost that in the modern world where Australia is next door to the UK, but I don't know who literally lives in the house next door to me. Um, I really think that we've lost an integral part of what it is to be a community. Um, so let's try and bring that back. And let's see if we can do something to change the lives of these millions of children that are being treated so poorly every day. So I said earlier that the mother and her boyfriend went on trial and this 10 year old half brother was filled with such courage he was able to give evidence at that trial not only did he do that but he also told Liverpool Crown Court what he did for Chelsea in her life which was he tried his best to care for her so he bought her chocolate out of his pocket money to try and make sure that she had something to eat um And he did what he could to try and care for her. He told the court that Chelsea was so thin that you could see her ribs. That she was really hungry. I think his phrase was she was dead hungry because she got nothing to eat. And he went on to tell the court that we knew, so I assume by we he means he and his mum, um, we knew he'd been hitting her. We could hear Chelsea making screaming noises, like she was being strangled or something, and then it would go quiet. Now, imagine being that little boy, and you can hear an adult carer figure in your household, in a room with your baby sister and she's screaming and you don't know exactly what's happening but it sounds like she's being hurt. So these cases where there is more than one child in the house it isn't just the child who is the subject of the violence that are affected. Every child in that house will be affected because they have to listen to what happens. And it's okay to say something that you hear often in a domestic violence setting. The kids didn't hear anything. They were never in the room. And that doesn't wash, especially in the UK, because our houses, generally speaking, are not soundproofed enough or big enough that you can get away from the sound of what is happening in another room. And children pick up on things massively, so they will hear what is happening. And then imagine the abject terror of that 10, 10, 11 month old baby. So the mother was um, convicted of assault and neglect, as was 
um, Mr Carlin, and he was sentenced to 10 years in jail. Now, in sentencing the pair, Judge Bryn Holloway told Carlin the following. So I'm going to read this so I don't mess it up. You carried out a sickening series of deliberate torture on Chelsea. Not only did you systematically burn Chelsea, but towards the end of her life, she was twice violently shaken, causing bleeding on the brain, the second of which directly led to her death. None of us in court will ever forget those photographs or the evidence of the doctors and the pathologist who carried out the post-mortem. And you can imagine what would remain as nightmares, I would think, for the jury members. And that's true for, you know, everybody who works in, in the child protection industry who deal with these cases in the criminal courts. We're all impacted by them every single day. After the trial, Detective Superintendent Russ Walsh, a policeman of 34 years, said, I've never seen injuries such as those Chelsea suffered. They were horrendous and what happened to her defies description. Sadly, I think death would probably have been a blessed release for her. And that is a heart-wrenching thought process that somebody felt that way um and then there was also um a quote from the crown prosecution service spokeswoman who said manslaughter charges were not brought because it was very difficult to prove who had done exactly what in this case and i think that is something that often is an issue in criminal trials where there are two parents who um, are in what we call the pool of perpetrators. So you know that somebody has been violent towards the child, but you're not sure which of the adult caregivers in the household actually carried out the, the act of violence that caused the injury. Um, and it is something that, that happens reasonably regularly, unfortunately. Um, and it does pose massive difficulties. It poses massive difficulties in um, family courts and in the criminal proceedings. And then if we move on to the next case, it's another Chelsea. So this is Chelsea Brown, who was two years old. She lived in Kirkhallam, Derbyshire, with her parents, who were a relatively young couple. Um, we've got Maria Brown, who was 26, and Robert Brown, who was 34. And we need to take a closer look at Chelsea's father, really, to understand what happened in this case and quite how wrong things went for this family. And most importantly for Chelsea herself. So, Robert Brown, who is he? He had a number of previous convictions, which frankly should have meant that he was never allowed to be a caregiver for a child ever. Um, in 1984, he was a, um, convicted of assaulting his 16 month old nephew. In 1986, he um, was convicted of robbery and sentenced to four years in prison. In 1996, he assaulted his sister. And in 1997, he assaulted his eight-year-old nephew by dragging him down the street and kicking him. And then in 1998, he made threats to kill both um, Chelsea's paternal grandmother, which is his mother, and the social worker during a meeting about Chelsea's future. So Chelsea previously lived with Janice Johnson, who was 
Chelsea's paternal grandmother. And that was because of the risk posed by um, Chelsea's father. And in August of 1999, um, having tolerated abuse from her son, including threats to kill her, um, she'd come to the end of her patience, really, and ability to cope with the fear and the lack of safety. Um, so in a sliding doors moment that sealed Chelsea's fate, she refused to take her back after a weekend of visitation with her parents. Now you can't blame the grandmother for making that decision given the behaviour of her son um, that she'd had to deal with, including threats to kill her, which I don't think she took lightly, if I'm honest. Um, but what happened next was even worse. So Children's Social Care decided to leave Chelsea with her parents. What possessed them in that moment to make that decision is anybody's guess. Knowing what her father had done in the past she was absolutely not safe to be allowed to stay with them so what happened on the 6th of December 1999 Chelsea was battered to death by her father she was shaken so violently that she sustained injuries that were similar to those that you would find in a victim of high-speed car crash. Um, she had a post-mortem that revealed 47 separate injuries on her head and body. Bruises running right the length, along the length of her spine. They found an imprint of her head in the ceiling where her father had smashed her into it. Um, it's just beggar's belief. And the mother described that the father would slap her, throw her around, even make her eat her own feces if she soiled herself. Now, that's not actually as uncommon as you think in um, cases of child abuse, unfortunately. So how did this happen and what exactly went wrong? Chelsea's social worker, Norma McDevitt, um, had visited the family 27 times in the last 10 weeks before Chelsea's death. She'd found a lock on the bedroom door, the outside of Chelsea's bedroom door. Two months before her death, she was taken to hospital with a black eye. Um, but the hospital were happy that that was accidental. She was taken to a paediatrician who said six of nine areas of bruising had no plausible explanation and at least one was deliberately inflicted. That didn't result in her being taken out of that home and three weeks later she was no longer with us. These findings should have triggered police involvement and a multi-agency case conference under Derbyshire County Council's procedures. Neither of those things happened. They had half a dozen calls from neighbours who said that they'd heard banging, followed by, by shouting, crying, and then silence on a repeat cycle. And two days before her death, the social worker actually offered um, respite care to the family. 
So respite care is where um, rather than a child going into foster care on a permanent basis or a kind of a, a 24-7 basis, so to speak, where families are struggling, they're offered the opportunity for a child to stay with a foster carer for a weekend or you know one weekend a month or one day a week or whatever it might be that they need in order to reduce the pressure points within the family but they refused it um neighbours said that they had warned social services that Chelsea was at risk after hearing Brown's outbursts of temper and the child's crying. Stephen Baker, who was one of the neighbours, said the only retort we got was, if you hear anything again, give us another ring. Um, which isn't really very helpful. Now... Both the mother and father were brought before the criminal courts and Chelsea's father received a life sentence for murder and her mother received um, a conviction of child cruelty and that um, resulted in her getting 18 months as a prison sentence which I think is pretty diabolical but um, that's just my opinion on that. Um, and then after the death and after the trial, there was um, an inquiry, an independent inquiry carried out by um, Hilary Owen. And Ms Owen points out that social workers work with a huge amount of risk on a day-to-day -day basis and I agree they do um, and they are often understaffed and overworked but that doesn't negate their responsibility to make sure that these children are safe. Um, just days before her death, Derbyshire social workers had been weighing up the risks involved in leaving the toddler with her parents and were considering whether or not to remove her. So in the, the UK, in order to remove a child from the home, you have to prove that threshold for removal is met. And the threshold for removal is um, that the child's immediate safety requires it. Now, that can be physical or psychological or emotional safety. It doesn't have to just be physical, but it has to be an immediate, re immediate risk to the child that you need to negate by removing the child from those um, parents or from that family. Um, the report found that Brown's murderous actions could not have been predicted. Had social services, health or probation professionals made that crucial decision to follow procedures, bring in police and call a case conference after a doctor pointed out the likelihood that she was being beaten, it is almost certain that Chelsea would still be alive. So even though you couldn't predict that she would die, they didn't follow process. And the result is that had they done that, they probably would have escalated it to the point of removal um, because physical significant injury i.e. the child is being beaten, would cross threshold for removal. At the end of the process, um, 
they listed key improvements that have been made um, and put into practice. So a child should not be returned to a Schedule 1 offender. So that's someone convicted of violent offences against a child without a thorough discussion with a senior child protection officer or without a multi-agency child protection conference. So in the UK, we don't just leave it to social services um, or children's social care um, to make decisions about children. The decisions that we make are based on a multi-agency approach. So that usually includes a bare minimum the police, health professionals, and children's social care. Um, the health professional could be um, a health visitor. It could be a school um, health representative. Um, but there is usually some form of health professional a police officer and a social worker as a bare, bare minimum. But it would also include invites to any other professionals who are working with the family. Um, they introduced regular refresher training for frontline managers. Um, they made steps to ensure that social workers have easier access to managers and that there was better communication between the staff, i.e. the social workers and their managers. So we can see that after this incident, there was a process of reflection and trying to understand what can be done better. But that is the same reflection process, unfortunately, that has been a standing theme, really, after these um, tragedies occur and they're still happening. So we still haven't got it right. Um, and I think what we need to try and do is do our best to keep trying to improve the way that we do things and to understand why these things are happening and I don't think it is just that there are faults with children's social care I think the problem runs far deeper than that um and as a community, as a society, we really need to take a long, hard look at how we raise our children and how we allow these kind of individuals who have all pervasive desires to control everything in their world um, and who have violent tendencies and drug and alcohol problems to continue to act in the way that they do. And I think it's got to be a culture change in society where we say this won't be tolerated, that kind of antisocial behaviour isn't something that we will accept as a community. So the next case is Sophie Casey, who was 13 months of age when, on the 10th of December 1999, she passed away. Her mother was Emma Casey, um, and her father was John Payne. Now, 
the couple separated when Sophie was three months old in February of 1999. And Emma Casey started a relationship with a gentleman called Peter Casey. Peter Casey was 38. He was a heroin addict who had been convicted of dealing ecstasy in a Tyneside nightclub. He'd lost his arm due to drug use and he was prone to quite unpredictable and erratic behaviour. Now, he started living with Sophie Casey and her mum, Emma, in 1999. And Chelsea, uh, Sophie was referred to social services in August of 1999 after she fractured her skull. And there was an investigation by the police and by children's social care. She underwent a hospital exam and the hospital concluded that they were content that the fractured skull was accidental on that occasion. A social worker took the case on. He was called David Potts. Um, but he then very shortly after went on sick leave um, and he didn't pass it on to his supervisor, Dave Martin. Now, Ideally, if you're going to go on sick leave, you then contact your supervisor and you let let them know. Apologies. And you let them know that there are various cases that you're dealing with and what needs doing urgently on them. That being said, the manager or supervisor of that individual social worker should have a reasonable grasp of what cases are allocated to them and where they're up to in any event. Um, so I, I don't accept that that's a genuine reason, but nonetheless, no further action was taken on the case. Nursing staff, teachers, neighbours, and even Sophie's own grandparents had all raised concerns with social services. The home was branded a disgrace. Um, Sophie once had a piece of foam stuck up her nose for a week. Now, I understand children have a very bad habit of sticking things up their noses. Um, and some children need to be taken to the emergency room or accident and emergency department as we have in the UK. But a whole week is a bit much before you get anything done about it. The paternal grandmother, so um, John Payne's mum, described Sophie as being dirty and neglected. The maternal grandparents, so Emma's parents, contacted Children's Social Care with concerns about conditions at the home. So we've not just got one party or one set of relatives that are making these referrals into children's social care. They're coming from everywhere. But nothing was done about it. And so four months after she'd been to hospital, 
and had an accidental skull fracture diagnosed. She died. On the 10th of December of 1999. And it was as a result of the neglect of these parents. So she choked on her own vomit after being fed a mixture of cheesecake, ice cream, milk and Weetabix by her father. I'm not sure that all of those things go together in any world. Um, but this little baby was 13 months old. South Town Townside um, Coroner's Office held an inquest and they reached a verdict of death by misadventure, which was contributed to by neglect at the hands of her mother and mother's boyfriend. Delivering his verdict, verdict he said, the focus from social services was not on the children nor does there appear to have been any positive actions to safeguard or promote the children's welfare. And I think that that's a fair comment in this case, because despite having referrals from a variety of sources, which would help to corroborate what each of them had said, um, nothing was done. Now, following those deaths in 1999, there was some legislation and guidance, government guidance that was published. So the first thing that came out was um, working together, a revised version of the working together to safeguard children guidance was published. Um, and it's a guide to interagency working, really, to safeguard and promote children. So the idea is that all professionals who are working with families or with parents all have a role to play in ensuring that the children in that household are safe. No one professional has the full picture. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle, really. And, th and this is the, the analogy that I often use is every single professional has got a piece of the jigsaw puzzle. When you get them all in a room together and put those jigsaw puzzle pieces onto the table into a picture, they form a full picture of what's happening in that house for those children, and to those children. And it's only when you have all of that information that you can then decide what the most appropriate course of action is. Whether that be offering a little bit of extra support to a parent or at the other end of the scale, taking the child out of the home immediately because there is a risk of imminent harm. Um, and then in 1999, the Protection of Children Act was passed, required childcare organisations in England and Wales to inform the Department of Health about anyone known to them who is suspected of harming children or putting them at risk. There was a similar act passed in Scotland, and that was in 2003. And we also had um, the Munro report, which focused on the system's ability to be child-centered. And her view was that that ability had been severely compromised. Um, bureaucracy and a compliance culture had obscured the centrality of 
relating to the vulnerable child. We then had a case which happened in 2000. Hi, Chaos. This is my little therapy dog. I'm just coming to say hello to everybody. So we had the case of Victoria Climbier, which was one of the biggest cases and inquiries in the history of child protection, really. Um, it was heavily publicised in the news and it led to lasting change in the system. So I'll do a deep dive on that particular case because it had such a profound effect that I, I can't cover it as part of um, a series of cases like, like this. <laughs> You want to get involved in the recording. Um, so it was Haringey County Council, their children's services department that was involved. And I think it had an impact on their reputation that has been very, very difficult to um, overcome. And the case led to Victoria Climbier losing her life on the 25th of February of 2000. She was an eight-year-old little girl who came from the Ivory Coast and was offered a good education in Paris by a distant relative who was called Marie-Therese Kouao. And in November of 1998, she was taken by Marie to Paris. So at that time, she was seven. And then in April 1999, roughly, they came to the UK. So between April and June of 1999, they moved into a hostel in North London. And then in July of 1999, they moved into Marie's new boyfriend's home. So he was called Carl Manning and he had a tiny little flat in Tottenham in North London. And they all moved in to that little flat. Um, and I've seen pictures of the inside of it and it very much looks more like a bed sit than a, a whole flat, if I'm honest. Um, and then in between July of 1999 and February of 2000, Victoria was abused at the hands of Carl Manning and Marie and suffered injuries from top to toe, burns amongst many, many other injuries. And she was made to sleep in a bin liner in the bath every night. So not Not that this would make it right, but not a blanket, pyjamas and another blanket on top of her or any of those things, just her and a bin liner in a grotty little flat in a dirty bath. On the 24th of February of 2000, Victoria was rushed to hospital with malnutrition and hypothermia. This little girl 
was so ferocious in her fight to survive that she clung on to life. She wanted to beat the circumstances that had befallen her. But sadly, on the 25th of February, the next day, she lost her battle. A post-mortem was carried out and the pathologist found 128 separate injuries and scars, many cigarette burns, scars where she had been hit with a bike chain, hammer blows to her toes and he described it as the worst case of child abuse he had ever encountered. The trial judge stated that the child protection authorities had been blindingly incompetent and the result was that Marie the aunt was convicted of murder in January 2001 and was jailed for life and Carl Manning um, was also convicted of murder and jailed for life. An inquiry took place afterwards and it was led by Lord Laming um, and it began in September of 2001 and he published his report in 2003 um, and it was wide ranging across children's social care, police, all the professions really that had dealt with this family. Um, and the conclusions were that the agencies involved in her care had failed to protect her and that on at least 12 occasions workers involved in her case could have prevented her death. Particularly, um, he condemned the senior managers involved. Um, health police Housing charities and social services all failed to work together effectively to protect this little girl. And the report describes that social services in Haringey could only be described as shambolic, underfunded and mismanaged. The report contained 108 recommendations in child protection reform um, and that included regional and local committees for children and families to be set up with members from all groups involved in child protection and a children's commissioner for England should be appointed and the first of those was Margaret Hodge. So the Climbia case was the catalyst for a huge amount of change in the child protection system as a whole. Um, and in 2003, the government introduced an initiative as a result of this um, called Every Child Matters, which was aimed at improving children's everyday lives. And that initiative is still going strong today. So it started in 2003. 21 years later, it's still going strong. The concept that protecting children is a multi-agency, multidisciplinary activity. And that every child should be supported to reach their full potential and live a happy, healthy childhood free from harm is at the heart of Every Child Matters. And you'll note that on my, um, some of my uh, material, every child mattered, matters is a phrase that is used. And the reason is that it is central to the child protection system in the UK. Um, after um, the Laming report, um, the General Social Care Council was introduced which is a regulatory agency um, 
that governs social work staff essentially and the social care institute for excellence was also created and that was designed to promote higher standards of practice all of that led in 2004 to the children act um the result of that was the creation of contact point a database designed to hold information on all children in england and wales that didn't last unfortunately and it's no longer in operation and i think it's a real real shame that it is not and um, we have the police national computer the police can easily see at the drop of a hat if somebody comes into their area and they're involved in a crime they can see straight away what this person's record is. In children's social care, there is nothing even remotely similar. So families who hop between authorities often escape the eyes of professionals. It created the post of children's commissioner um, and that person heads the office of the Children's Commissioner, a national agency serving children and their families. Um, 150 children's trusts were to be set up by 2006 and statutory local safeguarding children's boards were to replace um, what the, pre the predecessor to those was. So safeguarding children's boards um, are the people who look at cases where either a death or really serious injuries, injury has occurred to a child who is subject to um, children's social care involvement. But I've kind of jumped ahead a little bit because I wanted to demonstrate the size of the impact that the Climbier case had. Um, but the original death of Victoria Climbier was in February of 2000. So let's jump back to that time frame. So the next case. Oh, apologies. I've not bounced along the slides. So. This is Victoria. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful little girl who came away from her family for a better life, to gain access to education and to make something of herself. And what actually happened was she ended up in a dank, dark, dirty little flat in London being systematically abused until the point where she died. And it's utterly heartbreaking that there were so many opportunities to help her that weren't taken. Now the next case we've got is Lauren Wright. Um, and she was six years old when she passed away on the 6th of May of 2000. She lived in Norfolk, which is a part of the UK that is absolutely beautiful. I remember going on a boating holiday as a little girl. Um, so the Norfolk Broads is a massive set of waterways that is ideal for... Um, kind of leisure boating of a variety of means um, and I remember going on this kind of like quite a large motorboat that we stayed in for about a week and it was absolutely wonderful and my dad occasionally let me get behind the wheel and it was heaven um 
but I don't think that Norfolk was heaven for Lauren Wright. She lived with her father, Craig Wright, and her stepmother, Tracy Wright. And on the 6th of May, Tracy Wright delivered a fatal punch or kick to little Lauren. The post-mortem revealed that the fatal blow had caused her digestive system to entirely collapse. She had 60 visible bruises um, and it was described that there had been a mounted um, campaign of physical and emotional abuse against a defenceless child. Lauren was abused by her stepmother and her father just simply turned a blind eye. And that's devastating because what that says to a child is my new partner means more to me than you. That's what that says to a kid. And when a parent or caregiver prioritises another adult above the child that they should be caring for, even if there isn't any physical abuse, it will have a marked impact and result in significant trauma for that child. But where we're talking about an interplay of physical harm being caused, neglect, and then the emotional trauma of being not the most important thing to your parent anymore. The results are just blindsiding, really. Um, but here, Lauren, you know, she didn't get to suffer the the long term impact of what might have been happening in that home because she only survived until she was six. Now. Both the stepmother and the father were convicted of manslaughter. And I say to that, well done to the criminal justice system, that both of these parents, the one who was committing those acts of violence and the other person who was turning a blind eye and prioritising that other adult should be treated exactly the same. They both were the cause of what happened to that little girl. There were inquiries um, into the case, um, into children's social care, into the NHS and into education after um, after Lauren passed away. So let's look at them in turn. So there was an inquiry into Norfolk Children's Social Care and they found that when Lauren moved to Norfolk in May of 1997, Norfolk Social Services were not told that she'd arrived in the area. So this is what I was talking about before when families hop between authorities and places. It becomes very difficult to follow their um, trail sometimes. So almost without fail, even if there is a referral into the new authority, it's after the event that they've moved. But sometimes the place that they've moved from just simply don't know where they've gone. So they don't know who to tell about their arrival. 
Um, in this case, they did know where they were going, but um, they didn't pass on her details. So she'd been on the Hertfordshire um, Child Protection Register, but Norfolk were not told of her arrival. There was a full social history of members of the household and extended family um, not taken. They didn't convene a child protection conference, which is like the initial step is an initial child protection conference that would consider what level of support that child needs. Then if they are placed on the child protection register, there are review child protection conferences going forward. Um, there were a catalogue catalog of serious mistakes and missed chances to save Lauren. Interagency coordination was ineffective and the social workers had not acted with due urgency. Correct procedures weren't followed and coordination of the case was ineffective. So that was the outcome of the children's social care inquiry. And then there was an, um, an NHS inquiry and that found that there was a series of errors by health professionals and a failure to safeguard the little girl. Doctors were over reliant on other professionals such as social workers and teachers to act in child protection cases. Now, I think that is still a real problem today. Doctors very rarely are the people who make referrals into children's social care. Um, and it's a real shame because Obviously, they're far more likely to recognise what is and isn't a deliberate or non-accidental injury on a child. There was evidence of poor practice and poor communication in the NHS and child protection training um, was not really provided appropriately so um, that inquiry said that child protection training is essential for all health professionals engaged in services for children and it is not an optional extra um, and I think that that is really powerful. Child protection, safeguarding, it's not an optional extra, it's not a peripheral part of the job if you do anything with children it is an integral part of your job it should be at the center of what you do because otherwise what's the point in doing the job that you do there was an education inquiry and that found that school had not referred any concerns to social services and they hadn't followed existing guidance stipulating that all schools must have child protection procedures in place. The response was um, the education bill which requires all teachers to be on the lookout for signs of child abuse in their pupils Every teacher is a mandated reporter. Every school should have a designated member of staff responsible for child protection and procedures for handling suspected cases of abuse. Now, nowadays, that person is called a designated safeguarding lead and they often have within every school, not just a designated safeguarding lead, but a number of deputy designated safeguarding leads. The idea being that if there are a lot of things that happen at one time, they can spread the load. And also if the DSL isn't in school for any reason, whether they're on leave or they're away ill, then there is somebody available to undertake that role at all times. One of the big themes that this case demonstrates, which tends to be seen as one of the golden threads through all of the cases 
um, is that many professionals see child protection as the job of a social worker. It is literally just a case of that is somebody else's problem. That's not my problem. That's what children's social care is for. Um, but social workers might visit a child once a month, um, sometimes less dependent on the plan of support that's in place and the resources available to that children's services department. Teachers see the child every single weekday and they know them well enough that they will spot signs that things are not right they will see that there's something just different there's something off about the child that means that they can delve into it with them um, and often they just don't and it is heartbreaking um, I know many many teachers who work so hard to spot the signs of things going wrong at home to really kind of be that trusted individual that that trusted adult for for children who you know haven't got it the best at home and then you see others who just don't even think about safeguarding at all but teachers are often trusted by kids which makes them far more likely to open up about anything that's happening at home to the teacher they're far less likely to open up to the social worker that person who comes to see them once a month who their parents who have obviously not necessarily been as good parents as they ought, um, have likely said, ah, not trustworthy, that you shouldn't talk to them, they're going to tear you away from me. Um, all of the ways that parents... Um, impact children and really manipulate them into keeping quiet um so teachers are a key part of the puzzle if we don't have their input we've only got a small section of the jigsaw puzzle that i was talking about Doctors often have a very important piece of the puzzle because unlike the teachers who see the child every day, doctors will often know the family dynamics and whether there are any issues such as health issues or mental health challenges or family members who are using substances or misusing alcohol. And they'll have it in their records if the children have suffered any accidents or non-accidents. So they'll have a, a picture of, you know, how frequently a child is being taken to various accident and emergency departments because each accident and emergency department will send a letter to the GP. Um, so they often have a really important part of the puzzle as well. And it's absolutely imperative that agencies and professionals work together. That is at the heart of working together guidance. It's at the heart of Every Child Matters guidance. And it is absolutely at the heart of child protection. End of. Um, and I believe that there is really a huge need for more training for 
professionals generally, for doctors, for teachers, for school staff, for health visitors, for midwives. You know, for all of the professionals that might be involved with the family, it, it, there is a massive need for more training about safeguarding. Um, and whilst it would be wonderful if every child was taught by their parents that they can have boundaries about their own body and what the rules are around who can touch you where and when, Sometimes it's the parents that are breaching those boundaries. And if that's the case, who teaches the child what those boundaries should be? So it's really imperative that it becomes a key part of the curriculum for children right from the start of their school life. What the boundaries should be and what their rights are over their own bodies. I mean, what do you guys think? Should it be something that is readily taught right from the word get go? What more can be done to help people, to help professionals, to help family members and neighbours how to spot when something is wrong and what to do about it? Let me know what you think in the comments because I'm really interested to kind of get a really wide ranging set of views about this. Um, but that was the, the last one on the list for today. Um, so that's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. Please take a moment to like, subscribe and share and to drop me a comment about what you think. Um, let me know if there are any cases that you'd like to hear more about. Um, and remember, if you see something, say something. Just remains for me to say, please take care of yourselves and each other. See you next time.